Hello. Good afternoon. To a few of you, good morning. And I don't think there's anybody, well, I guess I could I could qualify as good evening, but just barely. So it's a, it's a pleasure to join you. Tomoyo and I have had a chance to get to know each other over, what, a few years? So it's nice to find to be involved in one of the Globus events. Um, and we have a simple plan, which is I'll talk for just a little while, give you kind of a general background. Uh, we realize in in this gathering, there are some people who know a fair, about, fair amount about the work that I and my colleagues have been involved with for many years, but a lot of you who probably know very, very little. Uh, some of the people here are part of the Globus program, but this is also a public event. So there are many other people who aren't part of Globus. Um, I'll just say one thing about Globus because I really can't really go too far without really saying things that would be totally inaccurate because I just don't know. But the whole idea <coughs> of what's called Koko Roshai, Koko Rosashi, which is uh, the sense of personal purpose or personal mission, is uh, Tomoya has explained to me, is kind of like the first principle of Globus. And it's a very easy principle for me to relate to. So I'm going to start off by just talking about what that means to me. And I'll use that as a kind of a bridge into talking about the work I've been involved with for a long time. So um, I actually grew up in, in Los Angeles. I've lived in New England for a long time. I came back to MIT initially as a, a graduate student, and I never escaped. Uh, but I've come to really love living in New England. I, I, I really think it's a beautiful part of the United States. And, and I grew up in a, in a context, a cultural context, which uh, was everybody had come to Los Angeles from somewhere else. So when I was a kid, this would no longer be accurate. But when I was a child growing up, I didn't have a single friend, another child, whose parents came from Los Angeles. Not one. So everybody had come from someplace else. And uh, my family had actually moved from Chicago when I was uh, four and a half years old. So it was very transient in that sense. I mean, if you, of course, know much about the history, I'm sure most of you know that California exploded, uh, Southern California and then Northern California later, mostly after World War II, uh, there was this mass exodus or migration from the east and central parts of the United States to California because everybody saw how beautiful it was and uh, the weather was great. And as a kid, yes, growing up in Southern California, Los Angeles area, uh, we were never indoors. This was good for parents, of course. The kids are always outside. I think I played baseball about 360 days a year. Uh, so it was a great place to grow up. But then, of course, there's one small problem with that. Eventually, everybody found out it was a great place to grow up. And we used to often joke uh, every year in the United States on New Year's Day, there was the Rose Parade, big parade in Southern California. And then there's a big football game, the Rose Bowl. And every year, it's a perfect day. Like not a cloud in the sky, 70 degrees, absolutely perfect. And we'd all go, oh, God, why can't it rain on the Rose Parade? Because the old joke was, the next day you could hear the suitcases closing as everybody's going, okay, we've had it with the middle of winter in upstate New York or Manhattan or Chicago. We're going to California. So before I knew anything about systems, I experienced this simple fact. Uh, eventually, my mentor at MIT, a man, G. Forrester, uh, developed as a principle called the attractiveness principle. When one place is much more attractive than another, people will move to the place that's more attractive. The only problem is then there's so many people, it's no longer as attractive. So it's a big balancing process, as we say in systems, a negative feedback loop where it's really great and everybody goes, but then everybody goes. So uh, that was my experience growing up in Los Angeles. It was uh, paradise as a young child. I mean, it really was paradise. Orange groves, lemon groves, mile after mile, you would drive in a car and you could mainly see palm trees, orange groves, lemon groves. And by the time I went away to college, which wasn't that long later, you know, 13 years later or something, uh, there were virtually no orange groves and lemon groves anymore. There were shopping malls 
in miles and miles and miles of freeways. So before I knew anything about human systems, I grew up experiencing this simple phenomenon that if one place is a lot nicer than another and it's easy for people to move, guess what? That one place does not remain nicer than the others for very long. So um, I think that when I when I started to ponder this term, kokoro sashi, um, it struck me that it was something that was very present for me from a very early age. And what I mean by this is that it seemed to me, and by the time I would finish my college and graduate school, and I was then, you know, more of a teacher and mentored others, and I would work with young people, and I'd say, well, don't worry about whether you're going to be a mechanical engineer or aeronautics engineer, or you're going to be an economist. There's only two things that matter. What are you really passionate about, and what difference do you want to make in the world? It always seemed to me that that was really all that mattered. It's a shame, it's a tragedy for someone to spend their life doing something that isn't really them, that isn't really their their life, their their work, what really matters to them, what gives them energy. Doesn't mean it's easy, of course. Doing what you're passionate about can often be very difficult. But you do it because you love it, because it's what you really care about and what's going to make a difference in the world. And so I think that's actually Koko Rosashi. You know, that our kind of life mission or our, you might say, a life well lived always arises at this intersection between what really matters deeply to me and what can really be useful to the world. So it was very easy for me to relate to that idea. And it's very nice to know that that's really a, a core principle for Globus. Um, I'll just complete a quick bi biographic sketch. You don't need much, but... Uh, so I, as you can tell, I eventually left California. I went to uh, school in the Bay Area. Then I went to graduate school at MIT, and I have been there ever since. Uh, partly is because I found a mentor. Uh, there was a person at MIT, I mentioned him briefly a minute ago, his name is Jay Forrester. Uh, and he was developing an approach to understanding human systems that at that point in time, this was the only place in the world to do it. Uh, Jay was quite famous in the history of technology, uh, as you might imagine, as an eminent MIT person, um, he led a team in uh, uh, just after World War II that built the first general purpose digital computers. So there's no like one inventor of digital computation, many different contributions, but in many ways, Jay is probably uh, the top of the list. He invented something called core memory. Core memory was the basic technological breakthrough that have developed the idea of digital computation. Um, interestingly, for those who know a little bit about the history of this technology, um, semiconductor came along about 10 years later. So the original computers that Jay and his team built were all built with vacuum tubes. So it was quite an amazing feat. And in the best MIT tradition, it was not just a laboratory project, it was built for a very practical purpose. After World War II, Jay convinced the U.S. Navy, and I'll tell you in a minute why it was the Navy, that the threats of security, if you can picture this 46, 47, 48, this time period, America goes from the euphoria of the end of World War II to the paranoia of the Cold War very quickly. All of a sudden, the threats to the country are very paramount in people's mind. Jay convinced the Navy that the amount of information or data that needed to be processed and analyzed to actually have a coordinated North American air defense system was much more than individual hand operators could ever do. This sounds strange today, but picture 1946. It's a crazy idea. This could only be done. You could only have a coordinated North American air defense system with some kind of machine environment to process all this information. There is today an entire floor of the Smithsonian History of Technology Museum in Washington, D.C., devoted to this project. The project was called Whirlwind, and they not only developed the idea of general purpose digital com computation, Jay, of course, invented core memory, but they actually supervised the construction of the first 28 computers ever built. Uh, there was a little company who was their contractor, 
Jay's graduate students supervised the contractor. Uh, that company was called IBM. Keep in mind, IBM was international business machines. They made adding machines. Computation was something no one had ever thought of this way. So that story is always fun for me to tell because, of course, it's always important to acknowledge our mentors and our teachers. And I did uh, get the privilege to work closely with Jay for about 10 years. But also, it's a fun way for me to introduce you to kind of the ethos of MIT. I stayed at MIT not only because I thought New England was a nice place to live, but because there was a kind of spirit there, which I really appreciated. Uh, I, you can imagine as a young person, graduate student, hearing these kind of stories, it's like, wow. Um, and I'll always remember when Jay used to tell the story, and it was about eight years from the beginning to the end of this project, it finished around uh, uh, 1955 uh, uh, or so. Um, and he said at the end of the eight years, 28 general purpose digital computers had been constructed, had been installed all around North America to coordinate an actual North American air defense system. Um, and he said at the end of the, the eight years, um, and of course, he in, invented, eventually patented for memory. MIT made a lot of money. At that point in time, it was the most money any university had ever made from a patent. Um Jay got a third, MIT got two thirds. So it worked out really well for both of them. Um, and he said, at the end of all that, we wrote a four page paper for IEEE transactions. So to me, that was what really excited me. A university where it wasn't about publishing papers, but solving real problems. And yes, of course you share what you learned and you publish a paper, but it's like, okay, yes, you gotta do that. But it's not why you do what you do. You do what you do because you're passionate about it. And because you think it can really make a difference in the world. So, right back to Koko Roshashi. Um, by the time that project was over, Jay was about 36 or 37 years old. Of course, he was obviously quite recognized as a technological genius. He, he is today in the Inventors Hall of Fame with the Wright brothers and Marconi and Edison. So, you know, he's kind of an elite uh, he had a technologist. Uh, but he said, you know, I, I've done everything I wanted to do around computation. What I really want to do is something I think is important, which is help human beings understand the systems they create. So let me say a few words about the work we've been involved with for a long time, because in many ways, uh, telling the story of Jay is a very good introduction. Um, as a kid growing up in Los Angeles, when you live through paradise destroyed in 10 years, you know, in the life from the age of five to the age when you go to college, you see the extraordinary change. And I would defy you to find anybody who you could put down in Los Angeles in 1955 and then 1965, just 10 years, and say 1965 is better. I think very few people would say that because the natural beauty was incredible. And you had everything you kind of needed to get around in 1955. So this is a real puzzle. And to me, it's in a way the puzzle of our age and the puzzle that's been the motivation for me my whole life. How is it that really smart, diligent people working very hard can consistently produce outcomes that nobody wants? It's really hard to find a human being anywhere in favor of climate destabilization. We all see the effects all around the world, the extraordinary suffering when probably the beginning of what will be much worse from the destabilization of our global climate, the typhoons, the floods, the droughts, the extraordinary migrations of people all around the world because the places they grew up and their families have been for many, many generations no longer are viable places to live. The political instability that arises from this. And it's not an accident. It's not bad luck. It's a consequence of our own coordinated efforts by very intelligent, dedicated people. Climate change is not created by the uneducated. It's not created by the poor. It's not created by the people outside of power. It's created by us as kind of embodiments or living members of the, you might say, the heart of in modern industrial society. And it's just an example. 
you can make the exact same case about the extraordinary inequity in the world. Oh, sure, I know there's some people who have enormous benefit from being, you know, one of the, you know, 50 wealthiest people on the planet. Uh, we did have done a lot of work with Oxfam, the, um, uh, the, the social justice organization based in England uh, for many, many years. And in about 15 years ago, they started a, a metric how, and they would list the 100 people, this is how it started, that had as much personal wealth as the poorest half of, of humankind. In other words, you take the total wealth of the half of the world that's the poorest. How many people have an equivalent amount of private wealth? It used to be about 100 when they started. It was a bizarre number. 100 people have as much wealth as half of the world's population. Today, that number's down to about eight. So, just a different example. Who really wants a world in which eight individuals have as much money as three and a half billion of the poorest individuals? But we have created that world. So, that was the kind of question that was incubating in me even as a child because I looked around at how Los Angeles went from paradise to a place literally by the time I went to college, they'd have to close all the schools during the day often because the smog was so bad. Now, the smog is much better now because that was a technical problem that had ultimately a technical fix, the smog being the air pollution, the particulate pollution. And literally, you'd have to take the kids in from playgrounds because it was not safe to breathe the air in 10 years. So this question, how do we work together so often, with such intelligence, so to speak, we're so smart, and yet we're so stupid. We produce outcomes that nobody wants. That's the simplest way to characterize the field of systems or complexity. And you can make the exact same point for business organizations. You know, people go to work because they really want to have something that they really love doing, and produce something they think really makes a difference in the world. And oh, by the way, if we do it well, we'll make enough money, we can keep doing it. That's what most entrepreneurs really want to do. But yet we produce a lot of junk that nobody wants and a lot of uh, stress that uh, in the end doesn't really add to happiness at all. And you can make the same case for school. You know, most of us have some sense, usually from when we're very young, of the joy of learning just the sheer pleasure of it. If we're fortunate, that pleasure stays with us throughout our life. Just we, we learn it because we want to learn it. We can't do this, and now we want to do this. And the joy of developing that capacity, when I say learning, that's really what I mean. I don't mean book learning or reading a book. I mean de developing a capacity to do something that you really want to be able to do. Um, so we all have that kind of poor understanding of the joy of learning, yet we create schools which most kids don't want to go to. I mean, really, think about it. If you made school voluntary, child could just decide, I go or I don't go, but how many kids would go? So just another example. We somehow have grown very rapidly in numbers, in economy, in environmental impact, and you might say in our technical knowledge, and yet we're not actually very smart. If you simply define, define real intelligence by the ability to consistently produce outcomes that you really want to produce. So that's always been the puzzle in our work. And in a nutshell, um, rather than thinking about it intellectually or writing uh, theory papers about what's wrong with organizations, uh, and coming from that MIT tradition, naturally, my interest was, how do you do it differently? Not how do you just talk about it? How do you not just analyze it? How could you actually create a school that kids would want to be at? How could you actually create a business that people would want to work and would like their children to work at and are really proud of what they accomplish? How would we go about creating a society that was really, you know, fair equitable, really gave opportunities to people and where you can walk down the street and trust.
the people we were walking down the street with. So you could take any domain. And so that became the, quote, learning challenge in, in the very simplest sense. How do we develop the capacity to produce more and more of the sorts of outcomes we really want to create? Obviously, that's a very simple, very general way to frame the problem. Um, again, rather than talking about it, uh, my interest was always how do we learn how to do it? We started off a long time ago, actually it was in the mid-1980s, uh, with a network of mostly American-based businesses, mostly big businesses like Hewlett Packard and Ford and Federal Express, and you know companies that were enthused about this question and had obviously resources to invest in. We formed a basically a learning community. Eventually became something called the Center for Organizational Learning at MIT, kind of a little research center. Um, and then uh, by the, about 10 years later, that became a kind of self-governing um, uh, network called the Society for Organizational Learning. But it was one continuous process of getting a lot of companies working together to, um, to really try to better understand how they could learn, how they as a human community, as a company could learn, not just individual learning but collective learning. Um, gradually it became apparent that a lot of the toughest problems in the world could not be addressed by business only. So we started a period of about 15 years working to build cross-sector partnerships. Probably the most enduring of those, something called the Sustainable Food Lab. It was organized in Bridgie 2002 to 2004 as we got Unilever, one of the world's biggest food companies, and Oxfam, who I mentioned before, one of the most well-respected social justice NGOs in the world together with a simple question, how can we create food systems that really work for the long term, that build social capital, environmental capital, and produce food we actually would like to eat. So uh, that's a network that still exists. So we started a process of organizing different collaborative networks. And the exact same thing has happened in education this last 10 years. Uh, where we have a, an approach uh, co-developed with a partner of mine at MIT named uh, Meta Boll, a Danish um, a biologist, uh, called Compassionate Systems. How can we organize schools around the idea that it is about understanding systems or interdependence, but do so in a way that we also see our own part in that and develop our sense of compassion. Compassion is a funny word in English, um, it usually is used almost as a synonym for sympathy, like you should have some compassion for this person. It's actually not what it means at all. It comes from the Latin root, compassion, being with the suffering of another, just being able to experience it, to appreciate it, not to necessarily fix it. But obviously, if you really feel for the suffering or difficulties of another, you're really interested in why and what could be done differently. And particularly where the systems part comes in, what is it about the systems we create to create the suffering, not just how do we help somebody individually? So that became a network, and that's been the focus for the last 10 years. Uh, today, in, um, statewide in the state of California, people do work with compassionate systems, both within school and out of school. The focus is always on kids, but a lot of the most important learning opportunities in, in the modern world, are not just in school, they're the community-based organizations, organizations that work with kids at risk in different communities. Um, uh, the province of British Columbia uh, has compassion systems leadership as one of its priorities for its own education system. And then there's uh, clusters of, of work going on at some scale uh, in um, some in Japan, not as much as Japan's fairly recently, but uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, um, or Jakarta in, in Indonesia, Australia, some parts of Northern Europe. So we've been trying to develop a global network by going deep at some considerable scale in a few places. So that's the work on compassionate systems. And that probably is a good place to end my kind of quick summary. Uh, there's been a lot of different things, but the reason I told the stories in the beginning is I really think the two stories of growing up in Los Angeles and then coming to MIT in many ways encapsulate the kind of core essence of what's always been my interest. You know, why are we collectively so stupid? And how do we not just think about that or analyze that or try to write something about that, but create options, create something different 
that MIT lab culture. So thank you. Thank you very much, Peter san for, for your talk. Um, you, your definition of kokorodashi might be better than ours. So <laughs> I need to talk to our founder and president. Um, but people who are new to Globus, um, Kokorozashi is, is kind of a, a center pillar of the Globus education. Uh, all our MBA students have been asked to present their Kokorozashi personal mission in front of faculty and in front of classmates. And as Peter san said, uh, Globus's uh, expectation is our MBA students, alumni, would do something important for society and also what uh, energized them. So uh, that is exactly what Kokorozashi is. Um, Peter-san, um, thank you very much for aligning to uh, aligning your life story to the Kokorozashi. Um, but maybe um, I thought as a introduction to our dialogue part, it might be good to explain about maybe event, uh, patterns of behavior, and system. Because your definition of system yeah. might be deeper and broader than a regular you know, understanding of system. Can you help us understand what you mean or what MIT means when you say system? I'm fixing up my little flip chart back there. It just so happens I've got a picture that I can use to illustrate this. So uh, the word system is a problematic word because most people hear it is a very technical term. You know, it's like, you know, we got a systems problem. We need a systems expert, computers, technology. You know, our internet's not working. Um, or the other most common colloquial use in the United States, hey, it's not my fault. It's the stupid system. Rules, regulations, rigidity. Um, but uh, the the tradition that I was kind of educated in at MIT, and I, I had been an engineering student studying systems before coming to MIT as an undergraduate. So, but it the tradition that Jay had really developed at MIT uh, was really quite different than both of those meanings. Um, families are systems; they're webs of interdependence. Habits, interdependent habits. They develop a life of their own, right? There's a lot of wonderful things that happen in our families. And there's a lot of pretty awful things that happen in families also. So there's a kind of agency collectively. You can't say it's somebody else's fault. It's the habits we've developed. In some sense, the, a human system is a web of interconnected habits, and again, families are a really good example of this. In many ways, family is our root system. So a system in a human or social sense is not uh, a machine. It's a kind of living phenomenon that we co-create by how we live. Now, that's all pretty abstract. So for years, we've used this little simple picture to kind of get at that territory in a way that people can really apply right away. So what I have behind me here is a picture of an iceberg. And of course, you all know that like 10% of the iceberg is above the water line because water is a very strange property that actually expands when it freezes. So actually ice cubes float, right? Icebergs float. Um, and what's on that surface we call the events. It's what you see. It's the thing that immediately grabs your attention. The old joke we used to tell is that the six o'clock news, and of course not the six o'clock news, it's the breaking news that you just learned about, the dramatic, significant, world-changing event that occurred in the last 15 minutes, right? Why, why is that the business model, right? The business model of all our gadgets is to addict us to looking at them. Because if we can be looking at them, somebody can sell us something. That's the core business model. We know that. It's to co-opt and addict our attention. But why does it all work? Well, it works at some level because of a, a fundamental um, feature of our biology. We notice that. 
right? Something dramatic changes in our environment. We notice it. A loud sound, a sudden movement. Notice, by the way, when you open your app or whatever you, you're looking at that gives you your news, almost always the banner is yellow or red. Yellow and red are the two colors in nature that signal danger, right? Think of a wasp, the bright yellow bee that stings. So all of this is basically tapping in to products of our own evolution. For most of our history as a species, the biggest threats to us were sudden changes. You know, the saber-toothed tiger sneaking up behind us. The irony is, of course, today that's no longer the case, but the programming, the biological programming is still there. So we always notice the events. Hence, we say it's on the surface of the iceberg. Now, the only problem is 90% of the iceberg is below the water. So what's below the water? Well, it's the deeper natures of our reality. The phrase here says patterns and behaviors. So yeah, that's an interesting event, but is it part of a pattern? Something that's been growing for a long period of time. Typically, you can talk about patterns of behavior, and this is what the kids who learn systems in schools learn, how to draw it as a pattern over time. Oh, yeah, the threat of this has been growing. Or, you know, there's an oscillation. These are patterns of behavior. The essence of systems thinking is asking, what are the causes of the patterns of behavior? What are the deeper sources? The phrase here you'll see, which comes historically from a lot of fields, systems fields, it says underlying structures. And the underlying structures in the social setting have two dimensions, an inner and outer dimension. This word here says artifacts. Any organization has its policies, has its organization structures, has its metrics. The artifacts are the more tangible part of the underlying structures, but the artifacts are only meaningful because of the mental models which shape them. Why do we measure what we measure? That's not a technical question. That's because we've always measured it. That's because we know how to measure it. That's because everybody says it's the most important thing. And oftentimes we end up running organizations based on the metrics that somebody thinks is important, but knowing that they're really not as important as things we don't know how to measure. But we anchor on what we can measure because of a mental model. It says, oh, no, that's what matters. So the underlying structures are shaped by mental models and artifacts. So it's a simple way to talk about um, system awareness or systems thinking without even using the word system. There's all the stuff on the surface, and there's the stuff deeper below the surface. The longer-term patterns, but then the deeper structures. Why things work the way they work. So, yes, thank you, Tomorrow. That's the way we've come to define what we mean by systems. Thank you, Peter-san. Um, what I notice attending uh, your workshop, your seminars, is your maybe lecture or your workshop goes beyond maybe Western thinking. Sometimes you talk about Africa. Sometimes you talk about Zen. Uh, last time you did even Aikido. And I remember the discussion uh, I had with you when you were talking about visiting Africa. Um, wh why have you had such interest? Um, yeah. I haven't seen so many U.S. professors, you know, <laughs> have an interest to, let's say, African society or Zen or, you know, Native American life. Um, I, I know that you have studied philosophy when you are at Stanford, but... Can you elaborate a little bit on, on, on your interest on that part? I guess there's a, a kind of historical, personal reason, but then there's a little bit more of, you might say, intellectual or philosophic reason. Uh, the personal one is, you know, I, when I was a kid growing up in Los Angeles, my best friend was Japanese. Interesting coincidence. So I kind of grew up in a Japanese home. And so I always felt very comfortable being in different cultural contexts. And eventually, of course, I, a lot of my best friends were Mexicans, so I got to be around Mexicans. And I just, I, I always noticed if you were really respectful to people, you could feel very relaxed in very different cultural settings. It was just my good fortune. You know, I, I, I really feel very fortunate to have had that personal history. 
as time went on, though, and I started to think more and more about these deeper problems I've been talking about, this kind of systemic idiocy or <laughs> lack of systems intelligence, I realized that it hadn't always been that way. That in many ways, we're much less intelligent today than we were 200 years ago. If you live in an agricultural context, believe me, you're aware of the systems of nature, water, weather, soil nutrients, the way, you know, you can be doing everything right, but the animals come and they eat your food. You have to live in a system. You're not in control. It's not like picking up a cup and getting your water because, you know, you want some water or getting behind the wheel of your car and you turn it this way and it goes this way. It's not a machine. So it was very evident to me that the dominance of machines in terms of shaping how we think, our deeper habits, was pretty recent. So I, then I got really interested in older cultures. It's that simple. And then, of course, just good fortune, I had the opportunity to do a lot of work in Southern Africa between 1985 and 1990. And, of course, that was a historic time when apartheid was gradually ending and a new kind of multiracial society was emerging. It was very dicey. It could have ended up in all kinds of conflict. And I, always, I still think that the, the journey of South Africa from a, a, a white-dominated culture to a multiracial democracy was a miracle, really a miracle, that that could happen without outright warfare. In any event, so I just had the opportunity to be in different places. Um, uh, today, we do a lot of work with different indigenous cultures. And the, the common denominator is really simple. You have to reach back before the industrial age, to start to understand humans functioning in more harmony with nature. In many ways, many people, historians even say it's really the agricultural age that changed it, because then we started to believe that we could do whatever we needed to to raise our food. We were the most important species. And if you look historically, a lot of the philosophies that are very human-centric really came with the, quote, agricultural revolution, because the really older cultures, and what I mean by old now, is over 2,000 years old. The older cultures before organized agriculture, of course, they still grew a lot of food and they hunted, but they had to live with a sense of not being superior because they couldn't survive with this belief that the entire universe is organized around the benefit for the human. We are but one species. So that's when I started to realize that so much of what I wanted to learn, I could only learn from older cultures and then understanding the journey that we've all been on. You know, a culture that's 10,000 years old has gone through lots of ups and downs. It's not smooth. They collapse. Uh, I spent a lot of time in central uh, Mexico and Guatemala. The Mayan culture had a tremendous centralization organization, all the phenomenal uh, monuments that were built, mostly between about three or 400 and about uh, 12 or 1300 AD. So a period of maybe almost a thousand years, 800 years, the quote classic era of the Mayan, and then it collapsed. Apparently from massive overbuilding and destruction of their ecological resources. However, if you go to the Yucatan today, or a lot of remote parts of Guatemala, the people still speak Mayan. Five, seven hundred years after the city-states collapsed, the people just went back to living the way they had lived for thousands of years before that. Because the concentration of power, the concentration of wealth, the characteristics that allowed you to build these monuments, usually to the honor of some individual man, um, just wasn't sustainable. Very much the kind of pattern we see today. So this collapse dynamic, you realize has happened. Most all cultures have gone through periods of collapse. And then if they don't wipe themselves out entirely, they have a chance to learn. What did we get wrong? Usually you have male dominance, extreme concentration of power and wealth, and then a whole system that just reinforces that. But it never lasts forever. So anyhow, I think that was a big part of my interest, trying to understand 
these kind of deeper dynamics of human history, and particularly how we go from being connected, a sense of connectedness, part of the natural order, to feeling separate and isolated, and of course, then very sad. It, it's, uh, uh, I, I would co- like to continue the dialogue, but la- last question, uh, and I, I like to open up after, after your answer. Um, Globus is a Japan-originated university. How do you see the role of Japan going forward? We are, in a way, a long civilization. Uh, yes. We will modernize, you know, following the United States. There is still um, a lot of culture left. But, um, you know, we are also moving into the event-oriented culture of Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok. What, what's your advice or expectation towards our country? Well, the fact that I, I know so little about Japan, and your question is very deep, will allow me to be very brief, and we can get into the open conversation. Uh, I have a little more feeling for your question if it was anchored on China. I spent about um, a month a year for 20 years in China because I had a teacher in China. Uh, But, of course, the Chinese culture, history, and Japan are are very interconnected in many, many ways. Very different, but very much interconnected. And to me, the answer is really simple. You know, we have to abandon the idiocy of the modern industrial society. Um, It doesn't mean going back in time. Time doesn't go backwards. human beings, but it does mean, you know, how do, where do we have within our culture the seeds of what could help us be a healthy culture in a hundred years? In Japan, obviously, it would be things like the Shinto tradition, uh, in China, the Taoist tradition, but all the spiritual traditions, right? They, They have a lot of things in them that are really important for what's meaningful for us as human beings and an understanding, most importantly, I would say, of human development beyond our modern Western school, deeper capacities of humanness. So wherever those exist, we need to preserve them, develop them, and ask ourselves, what do they look like in the 21st century? Thank you very much, Peter-san.